Welcome. Grace and peace be to you from God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'd like to welcome you to this online service for First Presbyterian Church in Pilot Mountain for October 18th, 2020. A few announcements before we begin. This week I will be out of town and therefore there will be no evening adult Bible study on Tuesday. Uh, we will be meeting again on the 27th at 7.30 p.m. in the sanctuary. The monthly session meeting uh, had to be postponed this past week, so we will be meeting again on the 27th at 6.30. If you have any questions or concerns, you can contact myself uh, or Bert and let us know what needs to be taken care of. Sunday, November 1st, there will be a brief congregational meeting after the service uh, to elect members of the nominating committee to elect next year's session elders. Our annual Thanksgiving bag in a, uh, in a bag project is underway. Uh, we do have a sign-up sheet with the contents uh, placed in the front of the church so that we can go ahead and get started on that. Um, they need to be turned in by Tuesday, November 24th. If you would please join me in our call to worship. Sing to the Lord and bless God's name. Tell of God's saving power from day to day. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before God all the earth. Scripture says that we, if we say we have no sin, then we are found to be lying and God is not with us. So let us take this moment to confess our sins both to God and to each other in our unison prayer of confession. Let us pray. What a debt we owe to you, O God. You have given us all things in Christ, and yet we withhold from you the honor and glory that are yours. Instead, we pay tribute to empire, plot to entrap the innocent, mock your truth with empty praise, and put your patience to the test. Forgive us, O God, and by your grace restore in us the image of your face. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar with laughter and the fields shout in celebration and the forests sing with joy. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And if you would please join me for our unison prayer for illumination. Holy One, true and living God, through the message of the gospel and the power of your Holy Spirit, Make us imitators of the Lord, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from Isaiah, chapter 45, verses 1 through 7, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him and strip kings of their robes, to open doors before him, and the gates shall not be closed. I will go before you and level the mountains. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I surname you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I arm you, though you do not know me, so that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make weal and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. And our second reading is from Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 to 22, and I'll be reading from the Revised Standard Version. Then the Pharisees went and took counsel how to entangle him in his talk. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true, and teach the way of God truthfully, and care for no man. 
for you do not regard the position of men. Tell us, then, what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why do you put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the money for the tax. And they brought him a coin. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Ben Franklin once said that the only things that are sure in life are death and taxes. And I believe he was correct in that assessment. And I should know. For two and a half years, I worked in the personal property department of the Kanawha County Assessor's Office in West Virginia. There, we assessed personal property such as automobiles, boats, campers, and mobile homes. And when finished, a tax bill was prepared and sent to each taxpayer throughout the county. The taxes were based on about 2% of the value of the vehicle, boat, camper, etc., and were checked by us to make sure that what was billed was what was owed. It could be, and was, a rather tedious job that did not bring much excitement. What was really fun was when someone came to our window and complained about their tax bill. They would most often ask why their tax bill had gone up when they had paid so less in the past. It was then up to myself and our co-workers to look over their tax bill, check it against the last year, few years' bills, and try to discover what was going on. And then it was then that we would tell the persons that for the past few years they have been paying on a 1996 Chevy Beretta and now they had a 2012 Chevy Silverado. There was just a teeny bit of difference between the two in value. Most of the time the persons would understand and go up to the office to pay their bill with some grumbling. Other times there would be shouting, name calling, and threats by persons who were most unhappy with their bill and we were caught between a rock and a hard place. If we said don't pay the tax, we risked our jobs and, risk paying, and they risked paying higher bills in the next year. If we said they needed to pay, then we looked like the mean old tax people. It was a no-win situation. So you can imagine how I felt for Jesus when I read the text for today. Talk about a tough situation to be in. Here he is teaching and someone asked about a question about taxes. In the temple, no less. What was going on? It just so happens that there was a lot going on here. Now, if there were two groups that despised one another in Jesus' time, it was the Pharisees and the Herodians. The former were sticklers for the law and its application in all parts of life and were low-key nationalists. The latter were the supporters of Herod the Great and then Herod Antipas, and were so favorable to the Roman occupation as it kept their people in power and gave them the status that they craved. One commentator stated that these two groups working together would be akin to Hillary Clinton and the Tea Party joining forces. So when the two groups worked together, it had to be something that would have threatened both, and that something was Jesus. To try to cheer up Jesus, they sent some disciples of the Pharisees and a few Herodians to flatter and then ask the no-win question. The flattery is good. They say that Jesus is one who makes no distinction between people, that he tells the truth in his teaching of God, that he is sincere and shows no partiality. One can imagine, though, Jesus looking at them with a look that says, come on, let's get on with it. And then they pop the question that is the real purpose for coming to him. Is it within the law for us to pay a census tax to Caesar or not? What do you think? We can wait for your answer. And this is a touchy situation. The tax was controversial and had led to an armed uprising in 6 CE that was put down by the Romans. It was to be paid with Roman money that was especially objectionable to the Jews. More on that shortly. And as always in Roman provinces, it fell hardest on those who could least afford it. The Pharisees hated it but did not make any moves of an overt gesture to have it revoked. The Herodians were in favor of it as it kept the Romans happy and therefore kept them in power. 
So how would Jesus answer? How would the rabbi with the people flocking to him, who had driven out the money changers from the temple, who had shown them up time and again, get out of this little conundrum? One can see the sly grins on the faces of the questioners and on the ones sent to ask the question. Jesus pauses for a moment. He knows what the questioners are thinking. If he says yes to pay the tax, then the people will regard him as a traitor to his own people. If he says no to not pay the tax, Rome will see him as one encouraging rebellion and take care of that very quickly. Jesus considers and then begins his answer in a very non-diplomatic form. He calls them hypocrites and asks why they are attesting him. And then comes the kicker. Jesus asks them a question. Something along the lines of, do any of you have a coin on you that is used to pay the tax? This was a big deal. The coin would have the image of the emperor or Caesar on one side and the inscription of Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus, high priest, on the other. This was with what the Pharisees took issue. Here was a coin that had an image and a claim of divinity, a breaking of the first two commandments. If they have a coin on them, and in the temple no less, it will show their hypocrisy in saying that the coin is blasphemy and the people should not carry it with them at any time. They would have been embarrassed to admit that they were there with the coin and beginning to wonder if Jesus was not about to best them once more. And when given a coin by one of the questioners, he asked, whose image or icon is this and whose inscription? Their answer to the question Jesus asks is, Caesar's. Then he says to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And with this the questioners are speechless and amazed, and they leave Jesus. So what does it mean to render therefore to, what does it mean to render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's? Are there two different divisions that we have to look, for, look at in our lives? Is there a secular and a sacred and the, never the two shall meet? No. There's, there is an explanation to this that I had not heard until I was studying this passage. Jesus is telling those around him that the coin he is holding is obviously Caesar's coin. See, it has his image on it and it has his name on titles. So, give, it, give to Caesar what is clearly Caesar's. The unspoken corollary to this is, whose image is God, shows God, humanity, and all creation. Therefore, using the same argument, we are to give God our very selves. Does this mean that we don't have to pay taxes or do things that are not part of God's kingdom? No, we still have obligations in this world. In our democratized republic, we cannot quite understand what the Jews and others believed, that kings and emperors were allowed to rule at the will of God. The first reading of, from Isaiah is proof of that. But in our society today, we still have the obligation to go and be in the world, to pay our taxes, to respect the government, and to do the best to live in a society with grace and humility. But that is not to say that we do not have boundaries. When the moral questions come, what is our response? When we are asked if it is okay to bomb civilians and torture prisoners in the pursuit of ending terrorism, what is our answer? When we are asked if it is okay to separate children from their parents and put them in what is essentially a cage, do we look away? When we are asked what the church's role is in the divisions of our nation between parties and people that seek to keep us divided, do we change the subject? Do we ultimately fold and give to Caesar what is God's, or do we stand and give to God what is God's? Do we allow the church to become enfolded in the civil religion of the nation, or do we stand and make known that our allegiance is ultimately to God? In late May of 1934, a group of pastors, church leaders, and theologians met in Wuppertal, Barmen, in Germany. They were there to discuss and draw up a declaration that said what they believed about the German church being folded into Nazism. What they produced was the Theological Declaration of Barman, which is in our Book of Confessions. This declaration stated that they were not against the unity of the country or that they hated their country. 
Rather, they were standing on the confessions of the faith and on Scripture to state that it was wrong for the church to be an organ of the state, that it was wrong for the church that did not stand up to the moral issues that were taking place in Germany at the time of Adolf Hitler. A couple of statements from this declaration are this. We reject the false doctrine as though, we were, as though there were areas of our life in which we do, would not belong to Jesus Christ, but to other lords, areas in which we would not need justification and sanctification through Him. And we reject the false doctrine as though the church, over and beyond its special commission, should and could appropriate the characteristics, the tasks, and the dignity of the state, thus itself becoming an organ of the state. They were rejecting the idea that there was anyone above Jesus Christ who should have the allegiance of the church. They were also rejecting that the church should be an organ of the government, slavishly bowing itself to the whims of the state. And what do we owe? To Caesar or the state, we owe what is owed to it. We carry the money of the state in our pockets, and we must give that back to the state. We may grumble about it, but we all pay our taxes in various forms. But to God we owe everything. We owe our whole beings. And while sometimes we stumble and fall into the trap of having things that we give to whatever our Caesar may be, we owe God all that we are and all that we will be. So let us give to God the things that are God's, and to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to have the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Our affirmation of faith is the Apostles' Creed. And let us say together what we believe in our baptism. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we turn now to the prayers of the people, I ask that you look over the prayer requests that are on page 6 of your bulletin. And look over those. We have a new uh, addition with Paula Gilbert with coming up with knee surgery. So keep those that are listed in prayer. Let us go now to God in prayer. Loving God, you are steadfast, forever enfolding even when we cannot accept ourselves. May your spirit empower us to imitate you by receiving those who feel judged and rejected by walking alongside those who despair, by encouraging those who tend to the broken, by affirming those who labor in love. We lift into your tender care those whose bodies, minds, or spirits have been weakened or crushed. We lift up to your compassionate grace those whose burdens, guilt, or fears seem too massive to bear. We lift before your expansive mercy those whose hatred, rage, or vengeance cannot be contained. We ask that you receive all these cares, loving God, and fill us with the light of Christ through the work of your Spirit as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hear now the charge. Go forth to declare God's glory among all nations so that God's wonderful work may be known to all. And hear now the blessing. Grace to you and peace from God the Father, through the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen.